Jesus and what he is and did. Now remember, youngsters, young ones, I told you with the communion Sabbath, what communion Sabbath is, it is the opportunity to be in the middle of a children's story. It is a children's story. Now, I got a question for the young ones. Which way would you rather have a children's story? Would you rather have one where you get to sit real nice and real quiet and listen to a story? Or would you rather have one where you could have your hands in there and be in the middle of doing it yourself? Which would you rather have be a part? Number two, you know what? I have always been that way myself. I'd rather have my hands in the middle of it than to just hear somebody talking about something any day. How many of the rest of you are that way? Which way do you learn better? Sitting and hearing a lecture or being in the middle of it where you can do it yourself and somebody kind of helps and guides. Which way do you learn better? A few years back, I was pastoring a church in Minnesota and I learned something when I was in Minnesota. Good Minnesotans have a toy for every occasion. Do you know which state in the union has the highest per capita boats? In other words, the most number of boats per number of people in the state. You know what the biggest, what the highest per capita boat population is as far as a state? It's Minnesota. It's not higher than, it's higher than Florida and higher than California. Minnesotans also have the highest per capita of minivans. They have the highest, uh, they're right up there when it comes to Minnesotans will be when it's winter time, they have their snowmobiles and their ice fishing houses, by the way. When it's time to be in the summertime, they've got their boats and their ATVs. They got a toy for every occasion and every time period, every season of the year. In fact, did you know? Had to be a, a woman that coined this phrase, but have you ever heard the phrase? The difference between the men and the boys is the size and the price of their toys. You heard that? Now, could it be that the God that created us in the first place knew that we learn better by having our hands in the middle of what's going on than just hearing something? Could that be the case? Could it be that God knew that about us? Could it be that God intended things to that way and that he made us that way? Take your Bibles with me. Genesis chapter 3. Sin first entered the world. Genesis chapter 3. How in the world is God going to deal with the issue of trying to train people to deal with the question of how does God separate sin from sinner? How does he do that? How does he get that point across to people that his desire is to separate sin from sinner? Sin first happens in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 21 the Bible says, And for Adam and for his wife the Lord God made tunics or clothes of skins and clothed them. Now I wonder where in the world those skins came from. Hmm? I would like to suggest to you that right here what you have is the beginnings of the sacrificial system, the sanctuary system. I believe God explained the sacrificial system, the sanctuary system to Adam and Eve right there. Now, through the Old Testament scriptures, you have the sacrificial system, the uh, sanctuary system, be expanded and expounded. It got bigger, it got more specific, it got more uh, technical, but the process and the issue was the same. By the way, how much power did the sacrificial system have to separate sin from sinner? How much? When it came right down to it, how much blessing did the blood of bulls and goats have for the sinner? How much? Hebrews chapter 10. Back in your New Testament scriptures, Hebrews chapter 10. What does it say? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. 
And the Bible says, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away any sins. The, the, that whole issue of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament had absolutely zero power to do anything for the sinner. So why in the world did God do it? Why did God encourage the people of the Old Testament to do it? The sacrificial system was any time there was a sin, somebody would be taking it. When, whenever in the old period of ancient Israel in the move from Egypt to the homeland, when the sacrifice of the sanctuary system is sitting in the middle, there was a distance between the sanctuary and the people that were all the way around. When you saw somebody walking through that, through that no man's land, taking his and a lamb with him. I wonder how many of the rest of the people were sitting there saying, oh, I wonder what John did. I wonder what was going on. I wonder what happened. In other words, I wonder if they had trouble with gossip back then like we do now. You know what I mean? Oh, I wonder what was going on. But how much power did the thing have? Zero. It was a symbol. It was a teaching tool that God gave to his people. It was a way, a hands-on way to learn. Learn what? To learn that somebody was coming who was going to actually be the one who could separate sin from sinner. Does that make sense? Now, Move along in time. You get to the New Testament scriptures. You get to the time period when Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and he's in that upper room. Jesus is there with that upper room, and he knows something that the rest of them do not know. He knows that in the next few hours... Within the next 48 hours, there is going to be a radical change that is going to take place. He knows that he is going to the cross within the next 48 hours. They don't know that. He is trying to get that point across, and it is creating tension on their part. He knows, let's see if we can do this. Can I say it this way? Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, Jesus is sitting there in that upper room with those disciples, and he knows that the purpose for the sanctuary system as they knew it is about to come to its end. Is that a fair statement? Is that a fair way to say it? Can I say it that way? That he knew that the sacrificial system, as they understood it, was about to be completed. It was about to come to its end. And Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and onward, And you, being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Jesus knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that the cross, Golgotha, was the place that was going to be the end of the sacrificial system. Why? Because all that the sacrifice, all that the symbol was pointing forward to was about to meet its reality. Is that a fair statement? When it met its reality, when Jesus became sin for us, all the symbols to remind them that he was coming were useless. When Jesus died on the cross, remember if you will, you read the story in the Gospels, the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, literally in the sanctuary, the priests were going about their business as always, and the priest was there about to do the evening sacrifice when he was shocked because the curtain was ripped 
from top to bottom in the sanctuary. You remember that? Now, we're not talking about a cute little piece of fabric that somebody could take and jerk it and rip the thing to pieces. We're talking something that was thick and it was several layers of skins and things. Nobody could do that. Gee, God was signifying that the system of ceremony of symbol was coming to its end because its reality was being met. Does that make sense? And Jesus knew that that evening in the upper room talking with his disciples. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. He is in the upper room with his disciples. Notice verse 35 with me, if you will. John chapter 16, excuse me, chapter 13, John chapter 13, and verse 35. Jesus says to his disciples, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. The way people are going to know that you are my disciples is by how you treat one another. Notice how he said that. Is it fair to say that the illustration that he gave, the, the experience that he had at the beginning of the chapter, was what he was talking about when he says, people may know how you treat one another. Could it be that the Jesus, and by the way, I believe the Jesus that was there in the upper room as a man with those disciples that was the Savior who was about to be sin for us was God the Son who did the speaking of our working world into creation. I believe that. All right? I believe the Jesus there with the disciples is God the Son who was actually at creation, did the creation story. I believe that. Okay? Okay? Could it be that he who knew a symbol was about to come to its end was putting together another symbol because the principle is still the same that human beings learn better when they can be, have their hands in it than they do by just hearing a lecture? Could it be that when he brought one symbol to its end, he was bringing another symbol in place to be a reminder? By the way, back to the communion story. Matthew's gospel of the communion story. Matthew's gospel, chapter 26 in Matthew's gospel, the communion story. Notice what he says. He quotes Jesus as saying, Matthew chapter 26. Verse 26. No, I didn't stutter. Chapter 26, verse 26. Matthew's gospel. And as they were eating, eating the Passover meal, Jesus took bread, washed uh, blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, he gave thanks to them, um, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. By the way, the fact sacrificial system of the Old Testament, the symbol, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it was pointing forward to the cross, pointing forward to Jesus being sin for us. Does that make sense? Pointing forward to him taking our place, being him who knew no sin, being made sin for us that we could be the righteousness of God in him. Does that make sense? That that symbol is pointing forward to that. Notice, if you will, Matthew 26 here, that last ver verse 27, notice what it says. Jesus says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the wine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
I would like to suggest to you that the communion service is a symbol pointing us to glorification with Jesus in heaven. The symbol of the sacrifice is pointing forward to Jesus being justification for us, becoming sin for us. It's pointing forward to that time period. Jesus now gives a symbol that is pointing forward to us being with him in heaven. Does that make sense? Now, how much power is in the communion service? I would like to say that the power in the communion service is the same power as in the sacrificial system. It has absolutely zero power to do anything. If somebody is here today say, thinking to themselves, very good, I'm going to partake of the communion together and that will save me, I'm going to say, that is a sad commentary on things. Just as much as, oh, I'm going to keep the Sabbath and that will save me. Or, well, or anything else. Salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. It is accepting Jesus' death for my death and me accepting his life for mine. Communion is just a symbol to act out that reminder. That's it. By the way, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is having a discussion, an argument, if you will. Can I use that word? Jesus is in the middle of an argument with the religious leaders. Matthew chapter 22. Verse 34. The Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the greatest law in the commandment? And how does he answer the question? He answers with two verses of Scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Could I suggest to you, communion is foot washing experience, love your neighbor as yourself. And the world will know that you are my people by how you treat each other. And communion is a reminder of that. It is the reminder that I am my brother's keeper. And it is a reminder that I need my brother to help keep me. Most of us don't like that part very well. But it is a reminder of that. <laughs> and the partaking of the emblems representing the shed blood and broken body of Jesus is the reminder of my relationship to my God. Could it be that Jesus gave us the opportunity to have a children's story with our hands on, to get right in the middle of it, to have our hands right in it, to remind us to remind us that the world will know that we are God's people by how we treat each other. To remind us there is nothing I can do to save myself. I need a Savior. And there is one who offers to be my Savior full and free. Amen? I will encourage parents, be the children's story for your children today. When you are partaking in the foot washing and then coming back and partaking of the communion, be showing and telling your children what it means. It is the greatest children's story God has to offer for us. Oh, and by the way, while we're telling the children, us children of older ages would be well to remind ourselves the meaning of the children's story as well. 
Communion is a children's story where we get the chance to act it out. That salvation is of the Lord. That I need to be cleaned and I can celebrate the joy of watching the water that was on my feet when it washed away, gets washed away, my sins go with it. Symbolically, of course. But that, that's what Jesus does, is clean us. And I am invigorated and renewed, justified, sanctified, will be glorified because of what Jesus is doing in me. Amen? That's not a bad children's story he came up with for us, huh? That's not a bad symbol that he gave us a chance to act out. And today is your day. Seventh-day Adventists celebrate an open communion. That is, we encourage Christians of any and all faiths to partake fully and freely, to be, um, have a part. For modesty's sake, we will separate. To do the foot washing experience itself, we have a spot for families, we have a spot for ladies, we have a spot for gentlemen, any of whichever category you're in, we encourage you to go and to be a part. That's only for modesty and to separate, separate rooms. But please participate together. Remember the shared experience of what it means. And then come back into this room and be seated so that we can celebrate together the communion experience. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for these symbols that remind us of Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is our Redeemer, Forgiver. We thank you that Jesus is our perfection or our maturity and helping us grow to be more like him each day. We thank you that Jesus is our promise of restoration and being made new and living with him eternally. We thank you that Jesus is those things. And we thank you for the privilege and the promise of representing him by how we treat one another. Help us to remember to treat one another like Jesus would treat us. Bless us now as we partake of these symbols together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.